Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello out there in uh, Archaeology Podcast land. This is Dr. Alan Garfinkel. I'm the president and founder of the California Rock Art Foundation. And what we do is we identify, evaluate, manage, and conserve rock art both in Alta, California and in Baja, California. We conduct field trips, we have trainings, exercise, we do research, and in every way possible, we try to preserve, protect, and coordinate treasures of Alta and Baja California rock art, of which there are many and diverse. We also work closely with Native Americans and uh, partner with them to recognize and protect sacred sites. So for more info about the fabulous California Rock Art Foundation, you can go to carockart.org. Also, I'm I'm open to give me a call, 805-312-2261. We would uh, welcome sponsorship or underwriting, uh, helping us to defray the costs of our podcasts, and also membership in California Rock Art Foundation. And of course, donations, since we are a 501c3 nonprofit scientific and educational corporation. God bless everyone out there in podcast land. You're listening to the Rock Art Podcast. Join us every week for fascinating tales of rock art, adventure, and archaeology. Find our contact info in the show notes and send us your suggestions. Hello out there in archaeology podcast land. This is your host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel. And we're going to have uh, Johnny Valdez, who's a prestigious and high-ranking Native American affiliated with the uh, Ute and Pueblo people in the American Southwest. And he's going to talk about his role and his history, his biography, and the kinds of work he's doing to preserve, protect, and introduce the general public to the uh, sacred sites, the significant artifacts, and other elements of the special perspective on art and archaeology. Out there in uh, archaeology podcast land, this is your host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel, for uh, episode 116 of your Rock Art Podcast. And we're blessed and honored to have Johnny Valdez of the uh, Paiute Shoshone Nation, a uh, highly placed and uh, sophisticated gentleman who's going to share insights and wisdom on the nature of his background and the perspective that Native people have on the heritage resources. Johnny, are you there? Uh, Yes, I am. So I I know that you had said you'd like to kick us off with a a bit of a blessing. Yes, let's do that. I am Johnny Valdez. I am Moanda Panakwasat. I am the uh, father of lightning. I have spent a, a great deal of time with the Ute tribes. My my heritage is Southern Ute. I am also Pueblo on my mother's side, so a lot of rich history. And I would like to start us off with a little blessing. I've I've heard so many of the podcasts and and they're wonderful. But one thing I've always hoped that people would do is give a, give a blessing, not just to the things that we're going to address, but to all the people that are out there listening to that we. Uh, we start it, started out in that way, and we start our blessings like this. Moanam, Grandfather, in a good way, we come together to speak about things that are so important to us, about lives and people who came long before we did, the great peacemakers and warriors of the past. They've touched our lives, and we appreciate what they've done to bring us to where we are today. We also want to say good blessings to those that we've taught, who will take it on to the future, who will take all the things that we've ever learned and improve them, help us to understand them. And we know they struggle, all of these young ones now, because they have a real difficult time. They're living in multiple cultures at one time. So grandfather, in a good way, help them. 
And to all those people that are listening and all those people that hear this in years to come, I hope that you, you get to hear this in the best way that you can and realize that we are Native people and we are still here. And that we have good love and we think good things of people that we don't even know. All of you are important to us too, because you're part of the world of the Great Spirit. And we appreciate all that you have to offer as well. There's much to learn from each other. So thank you, Grandfather, in a good way. The way, the way. Oh, thank you, and that's all. Amen, Johnny. Thank you, Creator, and thank you for the blessing of you being with us. And I humbly appreciate your uh, reaching out to me because I know you have quite a distinctive background and a lot to share with our listeners. So why don't we kick it off, Johnny, with maybe a, a bit of a short bio telling people about your background and sure. what your role is with the Native Nations. Yeah, absolutely. I am from what we call the Cloud family. Yuwachika is uh, how you say it in, in Southern Ute. We are Ito Aztecan, so it's a little bit different in, in Mountain Ute and Northern Ute and Paiute and Shoshone. But when I say Wachuca, people recognize that that means cloud. My family, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather, were two very interesting people that you've probably seen on television shows or movies, pictures of this big, handsome black gentleman standing next to, next to Native people, is John Taylor. He was my great-grandfather. He was, a, he was a warrior from the days of the Civil War. He fought for the 118th Colored Infantry of Ohio. And he moved into our area. He was a Buffalo soldier, eventually, in the 1860s and 70s. And eventually, he, he met up with my great-grandmother, Kitty Cloud, colored carnita. She was part Spanish and Ute. And uh, just a, a wonderful woman. And was the chief's adopted daughter. Her parents, Black Cloud and Pink Cloud, were very interesting people living in that era that we hear so much about between the 1830s and the 1870s. And their father, my great, great, great grandfather, Cuyagat, and his wife, Oat, they signed treaties with Mexico in 1848 and then again with the United States in 1849. So I have a pretty rich history in that, in that background uh, there. My great-grandfather, John Taylor, was an interpreter for the Utes, helped them with a bunch of the water settlements and land settlement deals, and also with organizing the way that they operated with the government, interactions between the tribes and the Indian agents of the time. And then his, uh, their daughter, Kitty and John's daughter, Euterpe Taylor, was my grandmother, who was a wonderful woman. She was born in 1899, passed away in 1993 at 94 years old, and I got to know her very well. I was born in 67, so her and I got to spend quite a bit of time together, and she was a wonderful woman with all kinds of cultural history and and just a, a beautiful understanding of many cultures. She spoke Spanish and English and Ute and moved in and out of all of those cultures very easily and very fluidly. She was a cattle and sheep person and took care of a ranch that uh, my father did most of the work for. And so she was on many committees for our tribe and helped with enrollment and membership. But she was also one of the very first council members of our, female council members of our tribe. So very interesting and uh, powerful woman. One of her sons, so one of her younger sons, was my father, Silvio Valdez. Uh, he passed away just a few years ago. We had him for 91 years and 11 months. Incredible man. He was a 30-year chair of the Committee of Elders, he spent a lifetime working for the government. He grew up in, in government schools, and then he stayed there and, and helped kids transition. And he taught guitar and basketball and all kinds of sporting stuff, baseball, incredible coach. And he was even more so a connected person to people. He spoke seven languages because of his time at the um, boarding schools. He could 
turn and speak to somebody in Pueblo, turn around, speak to somebody else in Ute, turn around, speak to someone in Navajo, and then talk to his friends in Hopi, and then return around <laughs> and talk to me in English. So, just amazing. So I, I come from a very rich history. I was a little kid that sat at all the fires and and listened, sang songs, and started to learn you know, what it was to, to be a Ute. Even though I'm one-eighth and not an official tribal member, I'm a tribal person. I just had my descendants hunt and, and got my elk uh, on Christmas Day. So uh, that was good. And I took my three children, my son Jesse, my oldest son, then my youngest son John, and my daughter Elizabeth. They all came with me and, and helped harvest it and take care of the animal and do our blessings and and prepare it to provide to all of our family and friends. And so because of all those things, my dad said one day, uh, hey, John, you know, uh, uh, Chairman Matthew Box, is he's the chair now, and he's a young guy. He's about your age. And he asked me, he didn't ask you, he asked me if you would be the executive officer of the tribe. And he said, I told him you would do it. And he just looked at me, and I said, of course I will. Of course I'll help my friend. And of course, I'll help my tribe. And so I spent a few years doing that job, which was, you know, really rewarding, difficult, but a a beautiful job of of trying to to help people understand each other and and work in and out of their history and and their understanding of of other cultures as well and try to bring people together in many years. But my chairman, you know, started uh, working more with government, you know, getting the governor of Colorado come down to our reservation and been down in many years. So it was really nice to, to get all of that done and be part of that. What is the geography or the, the area of your ancestry and, and what, what parts and states? Well, the three Ute tribes, there's, there's three of them. So it includes Colorado about a quarter of northern New Mexico, all the way down to Abiquiu. Mm-hmm. It in- includes about a third or not, almost a half of Utah, the eastern side of the state, and up into wow. about a quarter of Wyoming. So about 40 <laughs> million square Huge. miles. Yeah. How many uh, Native people still live on the reservation? Well, about 700 live on the reservation. There's about 1,450 or so. There's a, there's about that many that live on this reservation. On our sister tribe, okay. the Mountain Utes, they have about 3,000. Mm-hmm. And the northern mm-hmm. Utes up in Utah have about four or 5,000, somewhere in there. And we are, we are the people who dominated the central part of the Rocky Mountains. We, were, we are the mountain people. There's no doubt about it. And we worked a lot of treaties to to have other tribes come in and use the land and and provide services back and forth to each other and do trade. And we traded all the way out into California. That's kind of how how I, I got in contact with you. Yeah. What's your current role, your responsibilities, title, or the activities that you're engaged in for the tribe? Well, right now I just do contracting for the tribe. So we do all kinds of stuff. So anything from... Uh, Okay. Fixing roads and doing all those types of things. But I do a lot of work oh, outside of the tribe myself. My Myself and my brother, we, we've done a, a lot of work around the world helping with sovereignty. We've become experts in, in sovereignty and trusts and oh, wow. native finance. And we've helped yeah, that's, that's fabulous. tribes all over America, all over Canada, in Australia, and in Papua New Guinea. So, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a quite a trip that's amazing that. That, that's amazing yeah uh, and i've given fabulous speeches and discussion about the Ute people and in england and france italy everywhere i've ever gone and through in through central and south america i know we were going to talk about perhaps some of the heritage values and the relationship you have with various cultural resources including archaeological sites and rock art and and other um uh, sacred sites or places of, of great importance to your tribe? Right. You know, we I've heard so many of the different podcasts, some, some of yours and, and others as well, but yours are, are 
are very good because I, I like to listen to what's being said about the sites. When you talk about Little Lake, when you talk about Petroglyph Canyon and, and the different places that you've gone and the different people you've worked with, whether it's the Shoshone or the Kauai or who you're talking to, not the, only the petroglyphs and the pictographs, but the basketry and the pottery and, you know, etchings on hides and all the things that you go into and the detail that you provide reminds me that it's it's such an important discussion that we as natives have with each other in in our trade work and in our just our discussions in general. We had throughout history our tribe and, and other tribes would have certain dances that were sacred just to us and only our people were invited to. But most every tribe had dances that were community dances, dances where you invited other neighboring tribes. You might not be in conflict with the Apache or the Navajo, for example, and they would be invited to come to the bear dance. That's a very cultural dance. Chairman Matthew Box, he was, he is the current and has been the bear dance chief for many years and his as, as his grandfather was before him. Yeah, Johnny, let's stop there. That's a sure. good place to stop to stop. And in the next segment we can get into some of the the greater details and the unique perspective native people have on these uh, treasured, sacred and very significant resources. See you in the flip-flop, gang. Savings are officially in session at Tanger Outlets. Shop tax-free August 2nd through 6th and save up to 70% off the latest school styles. The best of apparel, footwear, accessories, and more. Save at Nike Factory Store, American Eagle, Gap Outlet, Crocs, Under Armour, Banana Republic Factory, and hundreds more. There's always something happening. Discover the latest fun and events all season long. Tanger Outlets, your savings destination. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Back to school savings are officially in session at Tanger Outlets. Shop tax free August 2nd through 6th and save up to 70% off the latest school styles. The best of apparel, footwear, accessories, and more. Save at Nike Factory Store, American Eagle, Gap Outlet, Crocs, Under Armour, Banana Republic Factory, and hundreds more. There's always something happening. Discover the latest fun and events all season long. Tanger Outlets, your savings destination. Well, welcome back, gang, to the Rock Art Podcast. This is episode 116 with Johnny Valdez, a prestigious and, and incredible resource for the uh, Native Nations, the Ute and the Pueblos in the uh, Colorado and larger environs. Johnny, we were just getting into talking about some of the unique ways that we have to deal with cultural resources and the understanding the theology or the unique perspective of native people in contrast to sort of the Western industrial Cartesian perspective. And I know offline we had a lot of discussions on that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I was uh, saying at the end of the last segment, you know, my my friend and, and chairman, Matthew Boxes, was one of these guys who was just so incredibly into who he was as a native as a native person for his culture for the people around him and bringing people together and it's such an important part of of all the things that you talk about on this podcast and what's so interesting about it is we we had a lot of difficulties yeah well let's let's talk about that and and those difficulties revolved around what particular subjects or issues well one of the most difficult was around repatriation and repatriation for those who really don't know what that is, is basically NAGPRA, this act that was put in place many years ago, that was just a, a situation where museums and private collectors and anyone who had found native objects or people that needed to be taken back to tribes could be done. And there was a, a process and a procedure for doing that. 
But in in that vein, there's a, a lot of people who won't give back these cultural people back to the places they belong. And you're talking about universities and colleges. Johnny, so these are so these are both artifacts. They're imagery. They're ritual and ceremonial and sacred objects. They're artifacts from an archaeological standpoint, but to a native standpoint, they are living beings with agency and aesthetics and um, power. Absolutely. And, and actual bones and skeletons as well. Some that were quite literally persons in the sense that we as basic humans understand what a person is. But there's personage, as you're pointing out, in everything. In, in all of the items, the work that went into it, has created that into something different. The use of a rock, the use of arrowheads, an arrow, a a bow, a staff, but also basketry and pottery. They're built by hand. They're they're a living object, and they are repatriated back to, to Native nations. And the difficulty is that a lot of times states, state of Colorado, state of Nevada, you know, these places have a difficult time letting go of those things you know they're held in museums they're in universities and colleges they're in they're in schools they're in classrooms they're in museums for people to come and look at and in some ways there there are some things when they're done well that really make sense and there's some where when you're a native person you walk in you just cringe you know that's like that's not honoring that person that that right there is a bone all made out of human bone i mean what are you doing and it and it's it's really difficult because it, it mixes in all of these other things that that we as natives have to be involved in which is fighting for for your sovereignty and the repatriation of your people and and their sacred objects back into into their land into their homeland and you see this happen quite a bit so when you say sovereignty help the listeners to understand what that means what that implies yeah, yeah so- sovereignty and of course <laughs> with native people we're quasi sovereign i'll explain that but but sovereignty means that you you basically are your own country you you do all of the rules. Everything is done within your own reservation or your reserve within your place. Your rules are what are followed. Your culture, your uh, spirituality is honored in that area. And other groups outside of you, say the state of Colorado or the United States, protects your sovereignty as a as the Ute tribe for the Southern Ute Indian tribe, for example, or or the um, the Acoma Pueblo, and so the the difficulty there is that sovereignty means that that you get to you know take care of yourself, you're self governing, and you do it all within your beliefs. But we are also imposed beliefs over the top of our beliefs by the United States government because all of these tribes in America are within the United States. So we have to follow those rules as well. So we are what is called quasi-sovereign. We're sovereign within our own borders, but then we also have these other rules that we have to follow. So it makes it confusing and difficult. And because it's confusing and difficult sometimes, other people will take advantage and say, well, I'm not going to provide it back to them because I don't really know if they know what they're doing. I don't know whether they have a way to take these artifacts or cultural pieces or these persons back and rebury them or do something with them. We don't know how to handle that. And so over the past 20 years or so, it's gotten so much better. So many different universities and colleges are bringing back rock art and, you know, things that we'd never thought. And they were like, oh, yeah, my grandfather got this off the Colorado River near Grand Junction, you know, almost 100 years ago. He, there's a picture of him standing next to it in this place. Wow. And then they, they send it back to the tribe and say, could you please take wow. this back? So. We've had all kinds of repatriation issues, and there was a wonderful lady who collected arrowheads, and, and the reason she collected these arrowheads, she was a school teacher, I don't know her name, but she was from Washington State, or her family was anyway, but she came down and, and taught school, you know, probably 100 miles away from here, 
in Alamosa, Colorado. And then she went up into the mountains near Silverton, Colorado in the, in the 1920s and 30s. And she would go on mining claims and pick up these big, beautiful arrowheads, spearheads, some of them paleo. I mean, there are many, many generations that spanned all kinds of, of, of arrowheads. She just loved collecting them because she knew they were going to get destroyed in the mines because the mining people were just digging up all the gravel and crushing everything up. So this lady took it upon herself just to come out and, and kind of claim jump and steal these arrowheads off of other people's property so they wouldn't get destroyed. And she just had them hidden away and wrote nice little notes about them. And then her family sent them back to the tribe. So it was a, a really wonderful repatriation that happened. Uh, but there's difficult ones too. You know, someone's building a road somewhere and they just hide it under the road because they don't want to go through that process because it sometimes can be time consuming and archaeologists have to come and and people like yourself you know I, doc i know that you've ha- you you do some of this out in it's, california it's, where it's, it is costly yes it yeah. is costly and time consuming and so these people don't want to do that and i'm just like you know you have to this is this was not your place. It was someone else's place. And, and unfortunately, we have to go and do this. And so the state of Colorado has done a very good job. I believe, I believe the U.S. government has as well. There are some funds available for people to repatriate things. You know, you kind of have to know the ins and outs of it and talk to somebody like me and get you pointed in the right direction. And then they can get some funding to get things back to where they belong and uh, the long process that's involved. Now, how do how do you and your your kindred folk think about rock art, about the paintings and the rock drawings that are in your area? What is your perspective, be it religious or sacred or however else, about archaeologists and the general public, etc.? How do how do we best understand or appreciate how to how to contextualize those resources? How's that? Yeah, I think I think what happens here is that people work uh, and the different kin, whether it's Ute or Navajo or Apache or any of the individuals, the Zuni. You know, you see all these beautiful art, this beautiful artistry that comes from petroglyphs and pictographs all the way. In the entire Southwest, we certainly have a, a wide variety. It's some of it's exactly as it is out in the coastal range that I've seen, and some of it is a little bit different. But what we do here is we put it into our storytelling, into our hunt stories, into our origin story. It's in the pottery. It's in the basketry. It's in dress. It's on hides. It's painted on your horse. It's in your staff or your arrowheads. It's, it's copied, let's say, in, for, for, to honor those who came before, even though something might be more effective you know, a different type of arrowhead might be more effective in, in some certain use. Use the most effective one that you can use. But you may have a ceremonial arrowhead that you copy off of, of a rock art, off of a, a petroglyph you've seen somewhere because it relates to your family or it's where your clan or your band lived. And when you go to that area, That is your sacred area, and you know where it is. It's hidden. It's usually someplace that's difficult to find, and and that's very powerful, and it means so much to your family and your people when they see you with it, whether it's painted on as war paint on yourself, on your body, on your horse, on on a, a hide representing a hunt. It's just a beautiful thing that it it's. It continues to live through all of the art that we provide uh, here as youths. So these pictures on the rocks are, as you put it, stories and also commemorations, memorials to individuals, to episodes of history. And also they would have religious and ceremonial implications, yes? Yes. And and I would say the most powerful thing about that is they are living stories, right? So they didn't tell the story just so it could be a one-time discussion 
and something to walk away from. It's living. So it's telling a story of how it happened, how it's going to happen, and what the future is of that story. And, and so that it can be added on to. Many times, if you look at petroglyph sites, and I've seen you with, I've seen you standing next to pictures of these sheep, and one sheep is clearly older than the others, you can see that somebody added to that story. There, you know, there were only this many sheep before, but now we have had an abundance and there is now this many sheep. And other places, you see where they've been picked off the rock because they're not there anymore. And that's really painful. And, and sometimes that's not damage done by outsiders or, you know, people who are causing a mess. Sometimes it's by the natives themselves saying, look, this is what happened. And, and this is how it has affected us. They're sacred drawings, very much like the discussion you had a, a, a month or so ago with the individuals from Australia. They're sacred drawings. It's really hard to call them, you know, pictures or pictographs, but but they are they are pict- pictographs. They are petroglyphs. But those things are sacred drawings, and and they're they're living, they're alive, and they have a spirituality. And the stories are on on the land. Absolutely, absolutely right. The land itself is alive, and so those stories, some creation stories, and other other episodes are there. And uh, as you're saying that, in part, I, I guess they, I call it, what is it? Personal memorials. There are sometimes, you know, commemorations of individuals that have passed, kin and ancestors and his history. Am I correct? Absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's such a history. I, I think about my daughter, who's this great artist. She's she's a great artist. And when she draws something compared to somebody else, it's as if the campfire is dancing behind her as she's making the drawing. She's in that place. And oh, wow. She sees it in a good yeah. way. And and that is what's powerful about these these drawings, this artistry. Yeah. What, what would you like to tell our listeners that may run across archaeological sites and artifacts or or see or want to see these native paintings or rock drawings, how would you want to communicate with them? What would you tell them? What I would say is to really enjoy them and see beyond what is just painted on there. Obviously, you can take a picture, but but blur your eyes a little bit. Look at what they were seeing. Take that photograph and, and pretend that you're dancing under a uh, beautiful full moon with the firelight around and your best friends there and someone's telling the story and remember that you're part of the story even though you're you may not be native you're part of the story you're part of humanity you're part of history you are alive as it is alive and as you honor it and look at it it's honoring you back with this story that's just uniquely yours Natives are still here. We may have a completely different world view, but but we are here. Yeah, you're still here. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have you back for the next episode, Johnny, and we'll give you the the full hour. But on this one, we're gonna call it quits at this point and pick it up on the next episode. Johnny, I really am honored to have you. Thank you. It was a great honor. Thank you. And at the the next segment, we'll uh, have a chance to reflect and collect and talk about some of the other things that I'm involved in. See you on the flip-flop, gang. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. 
Back to school savings are officially in session at Tanger Outlets. Shop tax-free August 2nd through 6th and save up to 70% off the latest school styles. The best of apparel, footwear, accessories, and more. Save at Nike Factory Store, American Eagle, Gap Outlet, Crocs, Under Armour, Banana Republic Factory, and hundreds more. There's always something happening. Discover the latest fun and events all season long. Tanger Outlets, your savings destination. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We saw the trendy, gently-used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Welcome back to the Rock Art Podcast, everybody, episode 116. I'm Chris Webster, and I'm usually the producer here, and sometimes I'm a co-host. And we just wanted to come in on a third segment on this show because, you know, it's not really a topic for an entire show, but a lot of people always wonder, you know, how do archaeologists actually make a living, right? What do they actually do? And Alan has got his hands in so many different things, like a lot of people do. There's never like any one thing, uh, especially for somebody who's got such varied interests, right? So we just wanted to talk about what actually, what pays the bills over here? What, what makes, what does Alan do and, and what does he offer the world <laughs> as far as uh, exactly. being an archaeologist and a consultant? So let's just, let's just go through the list, Alan. Well, I think I'm a little bit different from many other archaeologists, but some are the same and some are different. My greatest strength has not been the fieldwork side of the exercise of archaeology, but the writing and research and publishing aspects. So Mm -hmm. often my role is to take the data that's been acquired and then develop narratives surrounding it. Sometimes it's a scientific article. Sometimes it's a book. And I'm also approached by individuals who are not archaeologists themselves, but would like to be perceived as professionals, as scholars, as having expertise in this subject Mm -hmm. or related subjects. So for an example, I did a book with uh, two individuals who are uh, collectors of sorts in Native American basketry, California, the, the prestigious, beautiful masterpiece basketry. It took 10 years to create the book. I was involved with for four Mm. or five years, and I was the editor. They produced, it cost a quarter million dollars to produce the book, and I was paid paid $25,000 to be their editor. The reason that they needed Mm -hmm. me as an editor is they themselves did not have expertise in the anthropology, native theology, the linguistic prehistory, and the ethnic affiliations and the symbolism of the basketry. So all of that I brought to the table and had to help them. Really the purpose of the book became to honor and acknowledge these fabulous artisans who produce world-class objects, which now are in museums or private collectors. And what we did there was we had the photographs and the baskets, both historic photographs and contemporary photographs. So I act as an editor often and also, uh, you know, co- composing the uh, research itself. So I'm also approached by, by others who want to be perceived as professionals but don't have the credentials. And so they piggyback on my credentials and then we approach – various subjects that they have a passion for. I have a general contractor out of the Bay Area who came to me and wanted to uh, write scientific articles to get some gravitas and prestige and recognition in the profession. He went overseas, Mm -hmm. Berlin, Germany, and uh, examined their California Indian material culture collections and came back with photographs and massive amounts of information. And we took that and turned it into an article that appeared in the Journal of California and Great Basin Anthropology. And I was paid 
you know, a tidy sum for that particular expertise. It took, it usually takes about a year or two to really do a, a good scientific article and to do a book like the kinds of books I do, I would say a minimum of four years, two to four years to, yeah. to, to put a book together. On the other side, independent of the people that come to me for my expertise in publishing books and scientific articles, I do get uh, retained on a contractual basis to do, you know, I should call it cultural resource management, environmental compliance, either in California for CEQA mm -hmm. or in the federal realm for the National Historic Preservation Act and NEPA. We put rock art sites and other sites on the National Register of Historic Places or evaluate them. And we then also develop uh, conservation packages, interpretive packages. And we do this on contract for, you know, substantial amounts of money in the tens of thousands of dollars for particular projects where we provide the expertise to recognize these uh, resources. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. And it's such a, I guess, wide area, area of expertise because you wouldn't say that most academics could do anything in CRM. They're just not qualified from a permitting and regulatory standpoint. They're qualified from an academic standpoint, but not from that standpoint. And then, you know, on the other side of things, people who are in CRM aren't typically writing a lot of books and <laughs> doing that sort of thing. So it's nice to have the I guess the varied skill set, and that's what this really requires. So I, I, I live in, in multiple worlds. I'm employed formally as an employee from several, three different environmental firms. They also help me to get the uh, contracts, but I also do work independently as a consultant for my own sole proprietorship. Mm -hmm. and, I have, and I have the nonprofit California Rock Art Foundation that has sort of as an umbrella for a number of these contracts that we then yeah. either document the sites and place them on the National Register or evaluate them for the potential for the National Register or figure out some way to better document and archive their imagery, state-of-the-art technology, and develop particular measures to protect them, called cultural yeah. resource management plans. I did that way back in the 1970s when I became a, um, a temporary employee for the Bureau of Land Management and did my master's thesis for the National Register nominations of the Fossil Falls Little Lake area, and then also the protection plan and interpret it, interpretive brochures that went along with that, and they implemented all of that for the management mm -hmm. of that resource. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. That's really awesome. And now you have this platform as well to, you know, do that sort of public outreach. Yeah. Is that something common to many of the people who have programs on the Archaeology Podcast Network or not? Honestly, I don't think I would say so. I mean, a lot of people, they're only like creative and and I guess public outreach outlet is the podcast that they host, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times I mean, we have some academics, some pure academics on the show that, that, that aren't in CRM. And we have other people who are in CRM and that's what they do. And the podcast is their one like unifying thing. But I wouldn't say that they, they keep their toes in, in both worlds necessarily, the academic and the, the CRM or professional side of things as much as as much as you do, um, or other people like that. So, yeah, it's really interesting. And then you got the California Rock Art Foundation, like you said, right? And, and we and we have co we have cultural tours and and seminars, and we twin them with field trips. So the other thing that I, I like to do is make myself available to lecture. Mm -hmm. And I've been a guest scholar uh, to universities across the globe in Mexico and in in uh, India to. Um, to lecture and I'm compensated and they pay my travel costs and and I uh, go yeah. there for a couple of weeks and and present and meet with both the academicians the professors but also the students and it's a it's a tremendous honor and a privilege to sort of have that niche I've also done the same thing for other organizations like the Utah Rock Art Research Association or UC Santa Cruz also had me there as a guest scholar so yeah. I guess there's kind of many different platforms that I pioneer. And then with you, Chris, we've done webinars. 
Yeah. On uh, the podcast network, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. And those past webinars can be found. Actually, there some of the stuff can be found on the Archaeology Podcast Network YouTube page. So just look for that. But then also for members of the Archaeology Podcast Network, our past videos and webinars and everything we've done have always been right there available for members. So, and Alan, I think some of the stuff's available on your YouTube page yes. as well. Some of yes. the things that we've done. So yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead and. and uh, wrap it up there and mention that look in the show notes for this because Alan's email address and his website, dralangarfinkelgold.com are both linked on the show notes. They're actually linked everywhere in the show notes. So if you're listening to any episode of the rock Art podcast, you can find that contact info and, and you're more than happy to uh, respond to somebody and, and have a conversation with them. So anything else you want to wrap up with? I just, I would invite uh, an, anyone who has an interest in, in perhaps producing a scientific article or a book, you know, we could explore mm-hmm. it together and see if that would work. I recently got a, a phone call, several phone calls and contacts with a woman who has a you know private land that she owns where they found an enormous cache of Ooh. obsidian obsidian bifaces, projectile points, and other related numbering six hundred individual objects Jeez. that are sm- smeared with red ochre. And she's been wow. after me for, for years to write that up. So I'm finally beginning to correspond with her and, and work with her on that project. It'll take us a couple of years to, to put that one yeah. together. Nice. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. And uh, for everybody else, we're going to have Johnny back on on the next episode. So stay tuned for that. He's got a lot more to say. And so I'm looking forward to that. And with that, we will see you next time. Take care. See you all in the flip flop, gang. Thanks for listening to the Rock Art Podcast with Dr. Alan Garfinkel and Chris Webster. Find show notes and contact information at www.arcpodnet.com forward slash rock art. Thanks for listening and thanks for sharing this podcast with your family and friends. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.